Okay, so uh, first I would like to thank the organizers again for uh, inviting me to give these lectures here. Uh, so um, I will, well, I was asked to talk about variational methods for tensor networks. Uh, so yesterday we already had some sort of, well, discussions about, about variational methods uh, for tensor networks. Um, so uh, Tomotoshi talked mainly about um, stat-neck models, so I will talk about uh, quantum Hamiltonians. Um, and, and MPS for, for these, for these one-dimensional quantum spin systems. And only like in the last part of the talk, when I switch to the slides, I will also talk about, about the two-dimensional case of perhaps and how to do radiation optimization there. Um, so uh, I will um, sort of want to focus on the variational aspects of tensor networks and I really take this sort of variational aspect seriously. Uh, in the sense that all our algorithms are, are, are really variational in, in the strong sense of the word. Um, instead of like the sort of typical TBD algorithms or, or power methods that people typically use, where there's not a, like an explicit use of the, of the variational principle there. Um, and I will always work with these uh, sort of uniform uh, matrix product states. These are these uh, matrix product states that are sort of formulated directly in thermal um, limits. Um, and this is well completely different from from the, the talk of Natalia, uh, where she did uh, basically uh, finite systems always, and there, there you can use a VMRG algorithm to optimize over, over the state. Uh, if you work with uniform MPS, then you well need to do something else than VMRG, and that's that's mainly what I'm going, going to talk about. Um, so um, let me just start by sort of writing down the uniform MPS. the same like single tensor A just an infinite number of times on a, on a one-dimensional chain and these indeed these dots really indicate that we just think of, of this as an infinite chain with always the same tensor. So this uh, state is obviously translation inv uh, invariant by, by construction. Um, and the cool thing is that it, it's only parameterized by like one single tensor in, uh, in contrast to, to finite size MPS where you have like uh, n different tensors. On, uh, on the chain. Here we just parameterize the state by just one single tensor. And this is supposed to describe the bulk um, physics of, of your system, so the bulk properties of your, of your ground state. So in some sense, it is, this is a super efficient parameterization of your state in, in, in contrast to, to a finite system where you actually have like n different tensors. Now we can just parameterize the state by just like one single tensor. And this, the fact that we don't break any translation invariance also. Uh, uh, implies that you can also can look at uh, more, well, other symmetries of your system in a more transparent way, in some sense, uh, where, where, for example, like topological order and all these things is, is more like, nicely encoded in, the, in this in the symmetries of this tensor. I will not really talk about that, but um, for example, in 2D, this is very important to indeed work on sort of a translation invariant setting where, where topological order is very nicely uh, implemented in, in just the symmetries of like this one single tensor, basically. Um, Okay, so the, like I said, we want to take this sort of variational aspect seriously. So the, the idea that we always, always have in mind in this, in this sort of framework is that we have some kind of, well, map. This basically, this equation defines some map from, from the space of, of tensors, of just d times, well, physical dimension times d, where d is the bond dimension of the MPS. So the, the d times d, d times d, uh, space of tensors to somehow some kind of uh, state in your in your full Hilbert space. So this is some, supposed to be a Hilbert space, and indeed this sort of map defines some kind of variational manifold within uh, within this uh, within this Hilbert space. Uh, so as you can see, it's, it's very nonlinear this 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 manifold. Uh, but well, and this this would will complicate things a lot. But this is the picture that we sort of have in mind, that this low dimensional manifold of MPS sort of in, in within this super exponentially large Hilbert space, this manifold captures like the, the sort of the low energy states of, of your system, the ground states of, of, of the system you, you want to describe. And so the, the problem that we are kind of faced with in our, in our variational framework is always to find a certain point in, in, in this manifold, so this psi of A, 
uh, which describes the ground state that you're interested in. So you want to sort of find within this manifold some kind of uh, good approximation for, for the ground state of, of the system. Uh, and well, when I say system, like, like Tomotoshi said, said yesterday, you can just equally apply this sort of framework to, 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 to transfer matrices for set stop map models. But here I'm going to be interested in, in Hamiltonians for, uh, for spin chains. And well, to make things not too complicated, I will just work with uh, nearest neighbor Hamiltonians and, uh, today. Uh, so in the end, what we in the world, uh, sort of want to do um, is find the optimal approximation for the ground set of this, of this Hamiltonian. And well, the way to do that in, in any variational setting is always a variational principle, in the sense that this A that we are looking for will always be the sort of the one that minimizes variational energy. So now this, this thing. Right, so this is in the end what we will, will want to solve this sort of minimis, uh, optimization problem. Um, right. So this is more like the most general setting that we have in mind for for for, for this for this lecture. Um, uh, by the way, if there are any questions, please do interrupt me uh, if something is not clear. Um, now, yeah, well, the, sort of the problem, of course, is, is is how to think of this sort of expectation value. How we are going to to compute well, the variational energy, how we will be able to well, how will we minimize this, this objective function and all these things. So the question is how to make sense of these uniform MPS directly in a thermodynamic limit because at first it looks like well, you can write this down, but then I mean you cannot store this in like in a computer because it's sort of infinite. So the question is how to work with these these states in a numerical uh, way. And this is well this is basically sort of the uh, the subject of, of this talk is to how, how to implement this in a computer, this kind of uh, setting. Right. Um, so we have our, our MPS. So the first question that we want to ask is how to actually normalize such, an, uh, such a state in the thermodynamic limit directly. So the first question uh, that we ask is indeed sort of the norm of this, of this state. How does this look like? So if you just write down the norm. So we have our sort of, uh, cat layer, and uh, in order to 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 deal with that with the, with the bra, we just put these the conjugates of these tensors uh, in the bottom, and we just connect the physical indices. And this goes on forever, and this would be the norm of your state in the thermodynamic limit. Now, sort of the fundamental object in this in this norm is this operator. Um, I really think of this as an operator. This is what we typically call the transfer matrix. So the, this is a transfer matrix. Um, so this is an, an operator basically from, from these two legs to these two legs. So it's, it's some kind of, of matrix, big matrix. Um, and now you see indeed that this norm is basically just sort of a rep repeated application of this sort of from, from infinity and just apply this, this transfer matrix like an infinite number of times. So if you apply an operator no, an infinite number of times, you're typically interested in, in the largest eigenvalue of this, of this transfer matrix. And then actually you realize that this, uh, that this operator is what we call a CP map, a completely positive map. Um, and for this it is actually known that the leading eigenvalue of this so the spectral radius basically, well, actually the, really the leading eigenvalue, so the lambda max of this operator is some positive number. Uh, this is a property that's, that's well known in, uh, well, in mathematics. Um, so that, that's a very nice property because indeed we can sort of uh, normalize this transfer matrix by just dividing our, our, uh, our MPS tensor by the square root of this, of, uh, of this number, and then we know that indeed, sort of the spectral radius of this of this uh, of this operator is just one. Okay, so the, the leading eigenvalue is one if you just normalize it in this way, um, and then well, 
corresponding to this lead, leading eigenvalue, we have a sort of a left and a right eigenvector. So the left eigenvector would be something like this. This would be the, the, the eigenvalue equation for the left eigenvector. Um, and we have a similar thing for the, for the right eigenvector. So this thing is not emission, so these are uh, genetically not the same, the same object. Uh, so you have these, uh, these, these sort of fixed points. And then you see that indeed this norm that we write here, if we sort of come from infinity and we apply <coughs> this transfer matrix an infinite number of times, we, we just sort of find this, this left uh, fixed point here. So this norm is basically, well, this whole thing is just the left fixed point. So this whole thing is the right fixed point. So this is basically just the, the, the overlap between the left and the right uh, fixed point, well, up to a sort of constant, constant factor, which we actually don't really care about this, this, this constant factor. It's just um, uh, well, some factor, but let me just write it, um, that we don't know. Uh, and then, well, we say, in order to normalize the state, we will just say that this uh, we put to 1. Um, this we can just do by, because these are just sort of uh, eigenvectors, so we can rescale it like as we want. And this uh, will be uh, this, and uh, we just impose that this, this overlap is 1. And in this way, we basically normalize our state. So we forget basically about this, this constant. And we can actually do forget about this constant, because indeed, if we do any physical operation, so if you want to sort of compute a physical uh, observable in the system, so if you put like an operator somewhere in our chain, and if it's, because it's translation invariant, it doesn't really matter where you put it, and you would have something like this. This would be sort of the expectation value of an operator. Um, and then we can basically do the same trick with these, with these fixed points. So if coming from infinity, we just have the left, you have the right over there. So this indeed sort of, this is again proportional to this uh, left and then like this. And this is the same proportionality factor, of course. Um, so this allows us to basically, well, the expectation value, if you divide by the norm, this constant factor always drops out. So indeed, we can just forget about this and just say that this is indeed the norm and equals, equals to 1. So this way we have normalized the state and we indeed have to, we found like a, a way to, to compute local expectation values of this infinite uh, uniform MPS. So, okay. so another lo sort of local expectation value that we can compute is the energy. So this, this variational energy that we have. And this would be a, a two-site operator. So this would look like This would be the sort of the diagram for, for computing uh, the energy of, a, of your state. So where uh, this sort of this would be the that's a network diagram for the Hamiltonian uh, two set Hamilton. Okay. Okay. Um, like uh, another thing that we can compute is correlation functions of this uh, this MPS, this uniform MPS. So if you want to look at some correlation function. Uh, as a function of distance between like two operators. So what we have, so we basically start from infinity, have our fixed point L, our left fixed point. We have our first operator sitting on this side. Uh, then, well, we have just sort of the identity operators here, uh, which is basically some kind of, we just have our transfer operator on these sides, and n, well, n minus 1 number of times. Uh, and then we can sort of hit our second operator. And then we have our, our, our guide fixed point from, from infinity. So this would be the, sort of the general uh, expression for a correlation function. Um, and then we indeed see that, again, this transfer matrix operator that we have here, this determines all sort of physical correlations in your system. Because indeed, it just 
Well, the long range correlations are basically determined by, by just powers of this, of this transfer matrix. So actually, this, the, the complete spectrum of this transfer matrix is a very important um, sort of uh, object in, 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 in a uniform IPS because it determines all, all sort of correlation functions. So if you would sort of, uh, like to plot the spectrum of this, of this, uh, of this, so this would be the spectrum of this, um, this transfer operator. Now we know indeed that the leading eigenvalue should be this, this eigenvalue one. This is what we uh, well, have here. So the leading eigenvalue is one. And then we have just a bunch of, well, other eigenvalues sitting on, well, somewhere within the unit circle, right? Um, so one important um, property here is actually that there's sort of a gap between the first and the second eigenvalue. Uh, this, uh, this determines basically the correlation length of your system. Because you take just the powers of your, this and the long time, uh, the long distance limit here as you kind of uh, exponential decay. And this exponential decay is basically determined by this, by this, uh, by this gap in the transfer matrix. Right? Uh, and then, well, all the other eigenvalues basically are subleading corrections to this, to this exponential decay. Another thing is that, well, like I, I, I sort of plotted here on the, on the real axis, but you can have like, well, all your correlations don't have to be sort of non-oscillating, uh, oscillating. they can sort of uh, lie on these, on these, these spikes in your, in, your, uh, in your unit circle, and then this phi is basically some kind of, can be some kind of incommensurate uh, wave factor. So if you have these, these, these sort of lines in your, uh, in your transfer matrix, this points to incommensurate correlations in, in the system. Right. And so it's very nice indeed in the thermodynamic limit, you can just have any uh, incommensurate value of these correlations without uh, having to sort of make sure that you can fit this in, on a finite system or in any sense. So in, in the thermodynamic limit, you can just have incommensurate correlations in a very like, natural way by just having some, some Storm uh, like complex eigenvalues in, the, in your system. By the way, this is since this is a CP map, this always has to come like in sort of, uh, complex conjugate pairs. So um, another thing, actually, in this transfer matrix, and this is a paper that we uh, put out on Monday, I think, on the archive, is that it's interesting that that these that these transfer uh, these 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 eigenvalues always so you have some kind of gap which determines the correlation length. But then, these eigenvalues close to indeed this 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 gap, they become some, somehow dense. Uh, uh, well, you basically get some lines with a lot of these eigenvalues, with a small sort of discretization of, of these lines. And it's interesting because this is some kind of finite d effect, a finite bond dimension effect. Right. So if you would have like infinite bond dimension, you would really have like continuous lines in this in the spectrum with like. Uh, Right. Uh, so this finite d basically discretized, discretizes this, this, uh, these, these continuous lines in the transfer matrix spectrum. So somehow the gap between these lines, so the discretization, somehow induces some kind of um, co uh, effective length that characterizes your finite d. So in this paper that we put out, we showed that we can associate some kind of length scale. Uh, so to this discretization, and that this length scale is actually the one um, you can use as some kind of proxy for uh, for inverse, well, for basically basically the sort of finite size in, uh, in for example, Monte Carlo simulations. And we show that we can get a very nice like collapse um, collapse plots for the, well, if you sort of simulated a, a system with uh, a number of different Bond dimensions, you can nicely collapse all these data for like transition. Uh, if you use this, this delta as some kind of effective length scale in the system. So how does that depend on delta? How is L depending on delta? Is it really I mean, yeah, it's just, it needs, so we have delta is basically the, the sort of second gap in your system, or maybe some, uh, and then delta is basically just L minus one. Yeah. 
It's always minus one. L my, yeah, because these eigenvalues, well, uh, these scale as, as, length, as a length scale. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I mean, if you do a sort, sort of an RG scaling transformation, that is, that is, I mean, if you do like a, a blocking of two sides, that you just square the, the, the transformation. So these eigenvalues just scale as length. So I just <coughs> Can you see evidence of mean field critical behavior? Exactly. Uh, so we uh, sort of, yeah, we plot these scaling functions for um, for this delta, and um, and we saw for the need for very uh, for small weight. Mm -hmm. So that uh, for, for very large data, for very small data. So uh, no, no, very. Very large delta that we basically get some kind of mean fields, uh, sort of mean field correspondence in the scaling function. So uh, this this sort of confirms uh, the things that Nishino was saying yesterday about this mean field behavior that you have around um, at very small bulk times. Okay. We have, we have also seen that in, in some one D systems before. Sorry. We have also seen that in some one D systems. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> but you maybe you weren't here yesterday, I guess. Um, so, uh, well, Nishino talked about indeed your work as well on uh, these things. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, are there any questions up to now? Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, why, why these, uh, I mean, I think I'm not saying it about it. I am values yeah. uh, corresponding to the commensurate uh, state, uh, I mean, commensurate correlation functions must align around the. Yeah, well, line. this is some, some, some well, sort of observation that we made uh, at some point. But then, actually, if you if you think of some kind of, if you're close to some kind of scaling limit where, where you have, uh, where you can write on some kind of effective field theory for the, for the correlation functions, mm -hmm. uh, you can see that this transfer matrix basically, um, well, the spectrum of this transfer matrix basically um, corresponds to poles in, in uh, and correlation functions, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have like these these, these lines basically corresponds to, to like branch cuts in in, in some kind of Colin Lehman representation of, of your uh, mm -hmm. of your spectral of, uh, of your correlation functions mm -hmm. and all these things. Um, so that's the reason. Well, these these come mainly like like branch cuts in some sense. Yeah, I see. And then you know, I mean, that they should lie on, on lines. Mm -hmm. this sort of, that's so what, what the intuitive picture that we have for this. What I wanted to ask for the astronomy, how, how does delta depend on the bond dimension? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something you don't know in advance. Um, so, yeah, so <laughs> it, it should scale to, to zero uh, and yeah, but it, it's but it's the limit. But it's determined by the by the okay, other parameters in your system as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so we put in need some kind of hypothesis, mm -hmm. so size, a finite size scale, uh, like size scaling hypothesis, and then a long limit, like in the same sense that you do finite size scaling. That it, it's just a, a sort of a perturbation in the mm -hmm. system. So it's, it's like a scaling hypothesis on some level. We sort of prove this by uh, numerical things. Yes. Okay. But does that actually agree with what the, I think Tao Shang and maybe Lei Wang, uh, other people have proposed that? Uh, <coughs> you could just calculate the correlation length. In yeah, well, chain a lot of way. people previously sort of used the correlation length as a factor. Does it agree with yours? Then no, uh, no, it actually it has a different length, length yeah. scale. Uh, but what we what we show in this in this uh, in this paper that you can actually collapse also the correlation length, uh -huh. um, and this shows that um, well, as uh, indeed, if if the correlation length scales with this delta, then you can also use the correlation length as a scaling parameter. Uh, but the cool thing is that this this delta actually also goes to zero for gap systems, mm -hmm. while a correlation length doesn't uh, necessarily. Uh, so for gap mm -hmm. systems, this is really a finite like a finite size in some sense. Uh, so Uh, one thing that sort of complicates uh, the picture a bit of this of this manifold and all these things is the fact that you have uh, 
these, these famous gauge transformations in, uh, in RPS. Um, so the, the, the most, ch well, this is pretty well known by most MPS practitioners, of course. Uh, the fact is that if you, some kind of A, describing such a state, then you know that if you transform this A according to some x, x minus 1 on the virtual bonds, then this state obviously remains invariant. Um, so this means that indeed an A specifies like a state, but the, the reverse of the state does not like uniquely specify uh, a tensor A because you have these sort of gauge transformations that leave the state invariant. Um, well, and this, like I said, might complicate things uh, because indeed, well, in our manifold, yeah, I have erased it, you have some kind of, basically you have your different A tensors that basically point to the same um, same uh, MPS in, 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 your, in your manifold. Uh, but in fact, and this is also well known by, by all uh, users in the field, you can actually exploit these case transformations by, by constructing these sort of solutions these uh, canonical forms, yes. So in the term length limit, term length limit, you also have these canonical forms. Um, and one of them uh, is the, is the sort of, sort of so-called left canonical form. So if we define some kind of AL, so the representation of the state in, in, with an AL, Is some kind of gauge transformation of, of this original A. Uh, but yeah, additional so, um, uh, condition that is A, L, L A, L, um, that this is just the identity. Uh, so basically, this, this is the same that your sort of left fixed point is just the identity of the uh, identity matrix. Uh, this is what we, people call the, the left canonical form. You can also define the right canonical form. Which is well, another gauge transformer in this A. Uh, with, well, the sort of condition that this is, well, basically a right isometry, so this is, uh, this is sort of the MPS tensor is left isometry. Um, then you can transform this, this, this state that you have had in a very intuitive way. So can just uh, write our state this, uh, and just basically all a's to the left of this we make some by, by partition we transform all the states to the left of this um, with this case transform so we write down some kind of al form so we can transform all of these and, and well, the, the l's will, will cancel only and well, the last one will remain right. Uh, then we have, like on the right hand side, we have the same thing, so we can just sum up to, to the right column code gauge to the right of this uh, partition. And then you see, indeed, uh, if you do this, if, if you call this sort of matrix, this, uh, if you call this a center matrix, C, uh, matrix C, uh, then we can see that, indeed, if we call these indices I and J, that we have some kind of representation of our state as well, so C i j and then psi l uh, i and so psi r i or these are indeed uh, orthonormal uh, sort of orthonormal basis um, on the left hand side and the orthonormal, orthonormal basis on the right hand side because it's, it's, it's al and ars are indeed sort of isometries so this is indeed if we uh, take the svd of this C matrix, uh, this would be some kind of um, Schmidt um, normal form of uh, yeah, Schmidt, not Schmidt normal form, like the Schmidt decomposition of, of your state according to this uh, by partition. So indeed, SVD, this is what we call the, the Schmidt spectrum or the entitlement spectrum of your state. Right, and then, well, Typically, if you want to sort of uh, work with these MPS, one thing to look at, like I said, this is, is the transformative spectrum, but another thing to always look at of your, uh, from your, of your state in um, 
uh, the entanglement spectrum. So in principle, if you want this to be like a good approximation of, of some kind of state that you're interested in, you always want that this, this entanglement spectrum goes down pretty fast. Uh, and that's, if you have a good approximation, basically you want this epsilon uh, to be pretty small. So these are like the D, uh, the D uh, eigenvalues. So well, you want this to be lower than some kind of uh, location threshold. So this is the, the usual thing that we do in NMPS and DMG, but in terminal you can just keep it about, uh, define some kind of entanglement spectrum. Okay, and, and well, again, this entanglement spectrum also contains interesting physical information about your system. For example, well, if you have some special degeneracies in your entanglement spectrum, you can have some kind of SPT topological order. Um, if you're looking at at critical systems, there can be a lot of universal information in your um, in your entanglement spectrum. Uh, so, I mean, this is a very good diagnostic of your state to, to, to get like the physical information about about the system. Um, right? Okay. So this sort of concludes um, well the first part, sort of sort of the uniform MPS part, where we just I, I sort of explained to you all the properties of these states, but then um, we st we're still faced with the problem of how to actually variationally optimize uh, these states and, and for a given Hamiltonian, how to actually find find this MPS that is actually a good a good curve ground state approximation for the system. And that's what I will uh, try to explain to you next how to do this. Like I said, we want to um, have a variation principle at, uh, at our disposal, so we indeed want to find uh, find the MPS within our manifold that minimizes the variational energy. And then I will now like indicate uh, like the bars here, because indeed this is some kind of real function of, like, uh, by the way, all these A's are always, well, it cannot, it can actually choose a real, but it's simply more and more, um, well, it's actually better to, to always pick them complex uh, because of stability of your, of your algorithms. Um, I, well, the, actually the reason why you want to take them complex is because this, this sort of uh, objective function is gonna have like local minima, uh, if you only take like the real um, tensors, and if you take complex tensors, typically these local minima are are, are can we set up points and tensors. So the variation optimization is typically way more stable if you use complex parameters. Um, right. So we take we have some kind of objective function, a real objective function of, of like a, an a and an a bar, um, and we want to minimize this. So what we can do, well, like. Uh, again, like Nishino told you yesterday, you can do like power methods, you can use uh, imaginary time evolution. Uh, well, but here we are going to do like this. take the variation, like I said, take the variational aspect seriously and do like real variational um, optimization in the sense that we are going to just m numerically optimize this function by using <coughs> some kind of gradient search uh, within, our, within our manifold. Okay, and so. We basically want to compute the gradient of our objective function. So if you have a real function uh, of, of like an A and an A bar, the, the, the gradient is basically given by the, by the partial derivative with respect to the, to the A bar. This is, well, you can easily uh, derive this um, of this A, A bar. And then if you work this out, you get uh, D A bar. Well, let me just write it like this, uh, and I, I will put like one single uh, H operator instead of the full Hamiltonian because indeed the sensation invariant. So we want to minimize the, the energy density actually of just one one single H operator. Um, so we got this. And we 
know to uh, also differentiate the numerator. Um, Right, and uh, we will always work with, with normal at, at every sort of iteration of our, of our various, uh, variational update. We will work with normalized um, MPS so we can forget about this norm. So in the end, we just want to compute the sort of the derivative of this expectation value, basically. Right. So let me call this this h minus e operator, just uh, h tilde. Uh, then we see that this gradient is indeed somehow the derivative with respect to this optimization problem because it's a bar just like it's represent uh, it's repeated like an infinite number of times so this gradient will have to be some kind of sum over all these, these different uh, contributions so if we indeed take this sum the easiest ones are which are the ones so we just have the ones well the a bars that are on this well, on this Hamiltonian so we find let me just this is two and then uh, we can indeed like the left fixed point again. We have this thing. And then if you differentiate with respect to this A, we just leave this sort of this open. Uh, and we uh, right. So this would be one term in your in your expression for the gradient. Another one is, is if we differentiate with this other A that is on the of this A uh, uh, tensors that are to the right of this, this Hamiltonian operator. So let me, I will, well, I will do the, the ones to the left. So this is basically, so we sort of differentiate with respect to some, some kind of A uh, sitting over here. So this will find this. Um, this looks like this. And then we have some kind of sum of all, well, so if you differentiate with respect to, to this one here, then we have like n of these transfer matrices in between, and we take the sum of all these different terms. So basically we get some kind of sum, like n goes to from zero to infinity, of like the transfer matrix block. Um, to the power n, like this. And then we have this part of our, of our network. So this part where we diff just differentiate with respect to all of these tensors. Uh, and then, well, we have the same thing, same thing with where we differentiate with respect to all, all tensors to the right. Uh, and this sounds like, an, uh, uh, this looks like an impossible thing to compute, uh, because it's an infinite sum. Um, but then we, re we realize that indeed this, this n, uh, so this is a transfer matrix. So we have this thing. Um, we have this, this, well, this special, this special structure of this on the spectrum of this E order, right? So we have this one eigenvalue sitting on the on the on, uh, on one, and then all other eigenvalues go within the unit circle, right? So this means that basically we can sort of write this E as some kind of E tilde, uh, where we split off this projector, it basically projects on this on the subspace with, uh, corresponding to this this leading eigenvalue, 
and all the all the other ones, all the rest of the spectrum, then you know that this this is smaller than one. So this is um, this thing. So this means that indeed this infinite sum that we have here, if we just split up the sort of the, the regular part, then you know that this sum will basically converge uh, because you have like the, you have the property that the spectral radius is smaller than one, and then then we have some kind of divergent part. Uh, where we just have like an infinite number of these um, of, the, of this of this project. So this one is just a, a geometric series, so we can just uh, write this as, as, as this, and then we indeed have this sort of divergent part, which at, f at first instance looks pretty bad. Uh, but then, well, if you basically sort of plug this in, uh, then we. Gets. Uh, so the regular part, this or this this part, is basically uh, get something like this, and then while this this part. And then we get this, this sort of an infinite number of these uh, diverge uh, of this. Right, you get you get this. But then, well. Remember that actually we chose this, this h operator to be the, the h tilde. And then you see indeed the expectation value of this h tilde. Uh, this is of course zero because indeed we have sort of subtracted this, this ground state expectation value from the, from the h. So this is indeed a zero. So this infinite part sort of um, vanishes. So indeed we're only left with this, um, with this uh, convergent part of, of your... your um, and then, well, basically we have a like, part coming from the right. So indeed we have like a fi nice fi um, finite expression for, for a gradient in, in this way. Right. Is this clear for everyone how this sort of works? Okay. Um, so indeed we find an, uh, a nice finite uh, value for the gradient. By the way, this, this looks as if you would have to sort of uh, invert uh, a, d, a d squared times d squared um, operator, so this would the inver inversion of this thing would uh, would involve like a, a scaling of um, of well, d to the six operations to invert this thing. But in practice, you will never have to do this uh, in this way. We just need somehow the action of this inverted operator on this on this right hand side. So and this you can do by solving like a linear uh, a linear problem in an iterative way by some kind of complicated gradient method or anything. So in practice, finding this this sort of this whole thing is just something that you can do in in a d to the third uh, kind of a scaling. So I mean, this is not really a big problem in practice. Okay. The competition really is that more or less equivalent to uh, just applying the transfer matrix to the right and summing over those. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can indeed you can think that you can just take this sum uh, explicitly, but in practice. You can do, uh, this would be a power method to solve this linear problem, but in practice you can do like a bicondial gradient method which would converge a lot faster, I think. <coughs> okay. Right, so now we have, basically have our gradient, um, and then we can indeed do some kind of conjugate gradient method. Uh, for minimizing our variational en energy, or well, quantum gradient, or, or some quasi-Newton kind of methods, uh, whatever you like, um, and this well, for well, this will just typically converge uh, to to a, a variational optimum for a given Hamiltonian. Um, the local minima, can you get stuck? Well, in practice. Like I said, with if you take complex uh, tensors, then well, in fact, this doesn't happen. First, well, 
But I, I cannot guarantee you. That there was no you could still imagine that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can give you no like proof that they will not be local anymore. So, yeah. And in fact, this is, seems to be uh, pretty. Well, this actually never happens for some reason. Um, <coughs> One more question. So, in your experience, do you have to see a difference in uh, country gradient and the quasi Newton? Yes, uh, but uh, yeah, quasi Newton is, is, is faster. Uh, but in practice, I mean, um, one of the things is that, uh, well, I will talk about this, this later. This is sort of the, the, the minimal version of our optimization problem. In practice, we, we have a, a kind of now, we, in this algorithm, we never exploited like the gauge, uh, the canonical form for MPS and all these things. So if you actually use canonical forms, uh, these formulas are somehow um, a bit different. And then we have this Phobes algorithm that, that sort of exploits this. And this would be typically way faster in, in practice. Uh, so I would, uh, but yes, quasi Newton will, will be faster than that. And by the way, you can also, well, in the same way, you can basically just do like a double derivative of this of this objective function and compute the Hessian uh, in, in more or less the same way. Uh, and then you can actually use real Newton methods also to. And the Hessian? Yeah, yeah, well, we did uh, for, for, for MPS, obviously. For, uh, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, and then you really find a, a sort of a, a speed up with respect to just simple quasi -Newton. Um, another thing, actually, that you can try to do uh, is, is while we, we have sort of this manifold uh, picture that we have for, for MPS. So we, what we do is some kind of variational optimization over a manif over, over manifold. Uh, and what you can do um, is actually also take somehow the metric of this, of this manifold into account and do some kind of smarter uh, so like differential geometry kind of ways of, of doing the, Contribute gradient and all these things. And this, in practice, also helps. Uh, to uh, when you do Hessian, do you construct Hessian explicitly? Or you yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the, for the Hessian, we, we, we construct it explicitly. Like, it's a very, well, very similar calculation as, as this one. But then you say, like, huge objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, wait, no. Um, well, you have different implementations. They also have the one where you just need the application of the Hessian. <coughs> and this one, yeah. This is typically what you do. <coughs> okay. Sorry? Uh, no, no, it's the same. It's the same as the. It's, okay. it's just uh, you, know, you have to do like a double d derivative, so you have like, well, you can have like one of these, and then well, another like another derivative, and then well, you have a few more uh, of these diagrams. But then the end, it's just a linear. Well, you just have like a, a linear, like linear overhead, uh, but it's not. It's the same scale. So does this algorithm uh, guarantee the minimally entangled state? Sorry? Uh, this uh, guarantee the minimally entangled state? Minimally entangled state? Uh, yeah, well, but... Um, well, well, wait, what, what do you mean with that? Uh, what do you mean with that? If, if we optimize the... Um, yes. If we find a ground state using the DMRG, then this ground state if you have some kind of symmetry breaking you're talking about uh, like yeah, it, it, it's on, yeah, yeah well if you if you indeed if you find like if you you're working with a system with, with symmetry breaking you will typically find indeed the sort of minimally entangled linear combination of these or the, of the yeah that, that's a question uh, but uh, like uh, if the ground state is a uh, very uh, and because of this uniform uh, MPS, I will expect a test state. Right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, no, indeed. Like, like, like I'm saying, like, you will not find the cut state. You will find the minimally entangled state, typically, of your. Uh, in the emergence, but in this yeah, yeah, but also here. Yeah. yeah. But uniform. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Um, so this is the most s sort of simple onslaught. But if you have like sim uh, sort of translational symmetry breaking, um, yeah, if you run it. With this ansatz, then you will find the cut state that is translation invariant. But um, like one ex uh, extension that you have to do if you have like um, translational symmetry breaking is that you will have to go to some ansatz that looks like this, where you have basically two different tensors and you have to optimize over the two, two, two of these uh, uh, yeah. So that's what you have to do then. Uh, yeah. So this is the most simple case of.
like a simple, nice transitional thing. Okay. Yes, and the, well, yeah, indeed. So, um, so, and well, if you go to critical systems, indeed, this correlation length that you find here, so the gap in your transfer matrix becomes very small. So, indeed, this sort of this this thickness inverse becomes uh, becomes more more expensive. But uh, but uh, an MPS will always have like always have a finite gap. So that's in some sense. It's always. Uh, Okay. Right, so um so this was sort of the way to find current states of um of a given Hamilton. So in the the rest of uh the lecture I will um, I will talk about how to actually once you have found the ground state in, within your sort of variational manifold how to uh, look at low energy dynamics on top of this of this ground state. So this is well, typically you're not only interested in, in like the real like lowest energy state, but also in the spectrum above this, also in time evolution of your state. How how does the state evolve if you perturb it or if you quench it? All these kind of questions. Um, and actually, this sort of manifold picture that we have um, of MPS gives a very uh, intuitive way to also understand like low energy dynamics on top of this. So, so we had this sort of manifold of MPS, uh, which are supposed to describe ground states of gap Hamiltonians. Um, so, if we say for a given Hamiltonian, we find like one. Uh, one state that is the variational optimum. This is a good ground state. Uh, the idea is actually uh, that, that we construct some kind of tangent space on top of this, um, to on top of this manifold. So this is indeed some kind of nonlinear manifold, and then basically you can define some kind of tangent space that that sort of that's tangent to the manifold. Uh, this would be some kind of tangent space at the, at the point A. Um, and well, the claim that we make in this sort of tangent space methods, so this is what we call tangent space methods, um, is that this tangent space basically contains sort of the, the low energy the dynamics around uh, around this, this ground state, like so, sort of on top of this ground state. Uh, and I will try to uh, sort of convince you that, that this statement is true. Uh, by explaining you how to indeed simulate time evolution using this tangent space uh, idea, and also to uh, and how you can describe elementary acceptations on top of uh, on top of the ground state using this, this tangent space as a variational uh, space. Uh, okay, so let me first um, write down what a, what a, what a, a vector in this tangent space basically is. So this is if this would be your psi of a. And this would be some kind of tangent factor that's living in this in this tangent space. So tangent factor would be some kind of factor that depends on a. Well, it's it basically is a tangent space at this point, and it's parameterized by a new tensor b. Uh, and this would be so, well, the generic def uh, definition of a tangent factor is basically uh, to just differentiate with respect to your par parameters. Of your manifold, so you can have this thing, right? Uh, well, and this psi of a is this. Uh, this yes. So we differentiate with respect to like all uh, all uh, fact, uh, tensors. So this this amounts to some kind of uh, sum over all sides. Um, where if you differentiate and then we multiply with this B, bi, we just basically replace this a tensor with the b tensor at this so at this location. So what we in the end find is indeed some kind of uh, 
state that looks like this. So we take a, an infinite sum over all sides, uh, and we add this at, at, at the side, and we put like a new tensor P instead of the original uh, A tensor. This, so this would be indeed a tangent vector uh, on this on this manifold, right? Um, then, well, at this point you can already see more or less that this somehow describes sort of low energy dynamics of your of around around the ground state because indeed you can see this as some kind of well local perturbation of your state in some kind of momentum superposition. So it basically looks like some kind of like a particle on top, of, like some quasi particle on top of, of, of your ground state. So it's some kind of local perturbation, some kind of lump of excess energy uh, on top of, of, of the sort of universe. Uh, uniform ground state. So indeed, this looks like somehow the low energy. Yeah. Bi, all bi is the same. So yeah, yeah. Also, well, yeah. Indeed, there's all one single b indeed. Uh, yeah. So this this state again is translation invariant, uh, right? Okay. So it's again indeed. So the, the tangent space is just parameterized by a single tensor b. Yeah. So it's again uniform. Uh, right. Okay. So well, this may sound a bit like. Okay, ad hoc to, to, to say that this is indeed some kind of particle, but I, like, in, like in like 15 minutes I will try to convince you that this indeed looks like a particle. Uh, but first let me explain how to simulate time evolution using this tangent space uh, approach. Um, <coughs> so and this uh, this approach is what people call the time-dependent variation principle for MPS. Uh, or TGP. And so the, the idea of this time-dependent variation principle is that, we, well, if we just we want to time-evolve states, and so now, indeed, we're sort of interested in, in, in trajectories on this on this manifold uh, as a function of time, so we have some a of t, uh, and we want to find basically an uh, well a differential equation for this a of t. How how will this uh, look like? So what we obviously start from is just uh, the time dependent uh, Schrödinger equation. So we want to uh, integrate this equation. Right? And then, well, what we see is indeed, if we uh, take this left-hand side, and we can, well, this d over the t, we can basically, since the, the t depends is fully in this, in this one single tensor a, we can uh, well, write it as d a d t times and d over the a. And this d over the a is, of course, this, this tangent space con uh, tangent vector construction. And this d over the d a over the t we call a dot, and then we see indeed that this this right hand side is basically a tangent vector um, on top of this uh, on the manifold at a at a. So this will be some kind of a dot t a t. right with um, with the tangent vector given by this expression, right? Um, now the right hand side, uh, well, is not a tangent vector uh, because, well, this is generically is, is just something basically that, well, within the tangent space picture, the idea is that, uh, uh, this h acting on psi of a is basically some kind of vector that is like pointing out outside of the manifold. So in principle. The, the real time evolution you cannot capture by, um, like the full time evolution you cannot capture by, um, by uh, well, well, within the manifold, because indeed, in general, this H well, just sort of brings you out on the manifold. Indeed, if you do time evolution, typically it's sort of the entanglement entropy grows, so your bond dimension would have to grow. So the, the idea is that indeed this brings you out of your manifold. But, well, we basically want to simulate the evolution using like, MPS. So, um, so we still want sort of somehow to approximate this time evolution in a sort of optimal way. And the, and the idea now is to, indeed, if we sort of want to approximate this, 
variational way that the idea is to indeed somehow minimize uh, this this cost function. Uh, and the well, the minimization is basically if you if you minimize the error with respect to like a uh, a linear subspace, then you know that this is just a sort of orthogonal, orthogonal projection on this on this linear subspace. So what we do is somehow project the time evolution that brings you out of the manifold back onto the tangent space um, to to show you sort of the direction that you have to walk in on your manifold, uh, and this will be sort of the well the time of this would. Indicate you the time evolution that, that that you will have to do inside your manifold. So this is, um, well, basically the, the prescription for the time dependent variation of principle is just the idea that you project your time evolution, your exact time evolution, onto onto the manifold of your, uh, of your MPL, uh, onto the tangent space uh, of your manifold. Right? Is this clear? So, um, so in the end, the the equation. That you would have uh, basically this sort of tangent space projector that you put in between. Uh, right. Uh, so this will be sort of your, your TDVP equation that you have. Um, and now this, this tangent space projector is of course a very nonlinear operator in some sense as a function of this A. Um, so you know in the end if you, I will not work out the whole, all the formulas for, for, the, for indeed um, sort of working out this, 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 this DDB equation, DDB equation but in the end what we end up with is some kind of uh, differential equation for this A which is some kind of uh, function of A. And this f is is, is, is nonlinear because of this then, tangent space projector. So what we started with is some kind of linear Schrödinger equation, but by projecting down on our on our on our manifold, we end up with a sort of a, a set of like nonlinear differential equations for for this uh, for this a tensor, right? Um, but the cool thing is actually that this this uh, um, this TDVP equation has a, some very nice sort of, well, people call this symplectic properties. Uh, but I'm, I'm really not an expert in these sort of uh, things. So what I know about this is that um, this TDVP equation is, has like um, an, an exact energy conservation. Uh, which is very cool because indeed like TBD algorithms that, uh, that people have work with, a lot of time dependent DRG does not have this property that the energy is exactly conserved. So in the sort of update, you can actually sort of lose or gain energy, um, which is a very, well, not something you want. Um, so this is like definitely a plus for TDVP. Uh, and well, actually, uh, another cool thing about this is that um, that you can, well, because you have this energy conservation, this basically looks like some kind of classical um, Hamiltonian uh, evolution uh, for this for this A tensor. So, um, so how should I? Well, this Hamilton, well, sort of Hamiltonian evolution. So it's basically what you end up with is some kind of semi-classical uh, evolution equation of, of your of your system. Some sense, and, and since you have energy conservation, um, well, you can also define some kind of Poisson brackets and all these things. So in the end, you you really end up with some kind of uh, nice semi-classical picture of, of the time evolution of your system. Um, and this, well, I will show you later, also leads you to uh, well, the, well, the long time limit. You can find some kind of effective hydrodynamics uh, of your quantum system because you have this sort of, sort of semi-classical picture. Uh, so terminalization and all these things might be a very natural thing to simulate with TDVP and all these things. But I, I will talk about this uh, when, I, when I have the slides. Um, yeah. Uh, on the equation, since you talk about the symplect uh, property of the uh, uh, Hamiltonian system, then do you have a, the concept of momentum and the coordinate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can define indeed like conjugate co coordinates and all these things. And, and like I said, small brackets and all. You can start defining all these things. 
Uh, and it's still, I mean, people are still looking into what this exactly means and how, in what sense is this some kind of, somehow semi-classical and in some, what sense is it still quantum? Because indeed, like for larger, very large quantum dimensions, you still expect this to be like... So, I mean, the general idea would be that, that this somehow uh, characterizes this sort of this terminalization process where you start from like the real quantum evolution and you go to some kind of semi, some classical thermal evolution kind of thing, and then that um, TGV might actually be able to, to sort of capture this, but, but this is still, well, it's work in progress. So. Um, okay, this is clear. Uh, okay, uh, by the way, I will, I will show you in the slides, like, um, later on, like, some benchmarks for all these, th these things that I'm talking about, so. No, no, uh, like, Okay. Uh, and then uh, I will, well, you will be convinced that this actually works on these things. Um, okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is, like I said, the standard space contains a low energy dynamics. So one uh, thing is this TJP equation. And heat, this tangent space sort of shows you the direction in which you have to uh, walk on your manifolds in order to simulate time evolution in a sort of optimal way. And uh, the second thing is, is uh, that you can describe elementary excitations uh, very well using this, this tangent space idea. So we had our expression for this for this tangent vector. So one thing what we can do is, um, is basically just, so, so this state was, was just transition and invariant by constriction. So what we can do is basically give some kind of momentum to this, to this superposition. So what we, so this is set n. So what we can do is give some momentum such that indeed sort of the, uh, well, this is clear that this is indeed a, 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 a state with, this, uh, with, a, with a nice uh, momentum quantum number. Uh, and then the sort of the idea is that this indeed is a nice variational ansatz um, for describing elementary excitations on top of um, of your uh, of your ground state with a certain momentum uh, in the terminal I'm given. So indeed, since I mean, like I said, like like since you're working with infinite systems, this this momentum can take any value between a zero and two pi. So there's no discretization there. Um, and then, well, for a given momentum, you just sort of optimize uh, the variational energy of this of this expectation. Uh, okay. So, divide by the norm, and you just do it again, sort of variational optimization now of this B tensor. Uh, you actually make sure that sort of uh, that the state is orthogonal to the to the ground state. This you can easily do, um, and then you you find that indeed this is somehow uh, a good uh, variation answer to compute like this uh, elementary excitation spectra of your of your system, because uh, well, um, so the physical idea behind this uh, is actually that indeed this somehow this this one single B tensor basically perturbs your state in a small like localized region. Uh, the, so this basically looks like some kind of dressed quasi particle on top of on top of like a strongly correlated state. So because you have basically these correlations in your system here, this B tensor can have like a, a sort of influence the, the, the ground state in sort of in a large uh, large region. So indeed, this creates some kind of dressed like lump on your on your ground state, and then by variational optimization, you actually find good variational wave functions for for excitations as well. Um, Right. Um, so one op uh, remark is that, well, this like for the ground state we have to do like uh, a very expensive optimization because it's it's very nonlinear the, the optimization problem. So here for the excitations, this this wave function is actually linear in this in this B tensor. So opt this optimization problem is just just boils down to like an eigenvalue problem. Uh, 
uh, for this uh, for this B tensor. So this is not too not too expensive to actually do this optimization. And, uh, so one sort of takeaway message from this is that it, once you have actually have to balance it, it's very cheap to also compute excitation spectra on top of this. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, so this sort of concludes the blackboard part of the talk. Uh, I don't know how to set up the. Uh, okay. So, uh, well. By the way, all of these things that I explained is, a, uh, is all contained in, in a sort of um, in a well review art article, lecture notes article that we have written. Uh, so uh, this title you can find it on the internet very easily, um, and it contains like a lot more explanation. All these these things that I just brushed over very quickly. Um, so as a need to recap, so we have our sort of MPS uh, manifold, um, and then we have our Tangent space uh, on this manifold with, with this, this thing, and, and the big claim that we had was that this tangent space around this this, this uh, ground state contains all the low energy degrees of freedom. Yeah. Right. So the first thing that we did is variational ground state optimization. Um, <coughs> so we did some kind of variational search through the the, the manifold, uh, but in the end, like I said, this was sort sort, sort of first uh, simple uh, version of a variational algorithm. So uh, a few years ago, we developed this, this Rums algorithm, which is just a bit more complicated, so, uh, which, which works very well uh, in practice. So these are some benchmarks that we did for, uh, for example, the just the spin one half Heidelberg model. We did a variational optimization using this Rums algorithm. Um, and then we see indeed that this, if you look at sort of uh, the convergence time, as compared to IDMRG or ITBD, you see that indeed this convert is extremely fast as compared to uh, the other methods. Uh, and one thing that is actually very um, assertive to look at is, is this norm of the gradient. So the gradient that we computed before, um, well, a variational optimum is characterized by the fact that indeed the gradient becomes zero in your, of your objective function. And you actually see that only like a variational algorithm, so this Rums algorithm, actually brings down this, this gradient to like machine precision. And the other algorithms basically do not, are not variational. So TBD is indeed <coughs> some kind of, um, well, some kind of uh, imaginary time evolution with the truncation. So it's not variational. It doesn't optimize the variational principle directly. And you actually see that you don't reach like a variational optimum uh, using these, these uh, so it's, it's all, I mean, it's pretty accurate in, in practice, but it's instructive to see indeed that only like a real variational algorithm brings you to the exact, um, exact variational. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I said, well, um, well, you will find that the energy is, is like, uh, but okay. Um, the, the difference in energy might actually be the square of this normal gradient. I think. So in practice, you will never see it. Uh, See, see the difference in energy, I mean, uh, but still, I mean, yeah. Okay. It's just a slightly mark, like I said, in practice, this, this is not really a problem, uh, the fact that TBD doesn't bring you to the exact optimum, because in practice it works very well. Uh, it brings you close enough to, to be correct. So, so after that, what would be the performance of the uh, simple uh, rational method if you would go down the graph? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I really cannot. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I won't understand what's the advantage of UMPS uh, compared to the. Yeah, yeah, but I think. No, it will be pretty slow. I guess it will be comparable to ITVD or something like that. Yeah, in, in the spot. But, uh, yeah, I would have to check on that. Okay. So, well, this is another part of the spin one model where I need. Well, the, well, this is a gap model, and this Rums algorithm basically brings you down to the very small problem, like almost directly. Well, like a power method, typically takes like ITBD is essentially a power method, so it's uh, it converses with so ITMG as well. Uh, and again, the same thing is uh, you see, it doesn't bring you back to the exact very small Um Right? Okay, so. Uh, 
So that's about like variational ground state optimization. And this CDFP algorithm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so on the version to uh, ITBD. Yeah. So in IT, ITBD, do you like reduce uh, um, time in intervals to a very small number? Yeah, yeah. So I guess this was pushed to, to like in its like. Because you have your total error, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this was pushed to, to like. Okay. Uh, if, like you, um, if you choose different. Um, yeah, yeah, I think this, this basically is conversion and uh, like uh, total error. And stuff. Oh. Um, okay, so the time dependent variation principle. Um, like I said, this is somehow projecting down your time dependent shooting equation. To your um, to your tangent space, so this so using this tangent space projective, so you have some kind of nonlinear differential equation that we have to solve uh, numerically, um, uh, and then well in practice you see for example this this uh, well if you do this, the, like these local quenches and all these things, I mean you get like the, the, the dynamics out of this very nicely. Uh, I don't really have any compare. There's like a review paper where all these, uh, by, uh, by some other authors, where, where they actually compare all these different time, time evolution um, algorithms. I should have mentioned it on the slide. Uh, and there, I mean, TDP is somehow well, comparable to all other uh, time, uh, time evolution uh, algorithms, like TBD or TD1. Yeah. So, so you mentioned this in the lab, isn't it? You're the equation motion, then we integrate the OD. Yeah, you have to uh, use the synthetic mm. integral theorem. Yes, uh, that's what you want. To coin. You can just do, do like simpler things, but if you really want to convert conserve energy, you have to do the synthetic. Uh, yeah. uh, but like I said, the, the real interest of this TDP is the fact that, well, if you run this, the fact that you have this energy conservation basically allows you to indeed reach some kind of long-term uh, state. Which is some kind of semi-classical uh, picture of, of your real dynamics, uh, and, and, and in this paper, these authors uh, sh uh, showed that they indeed could observe like a like ni nice hydrodynamic behavior for long time uh, limits, so and, and, and you could sort of sort of start to simulate uh, term terminalization and all these things using um, using this TDP. and this definitely you will not be able to see using TBD or, or, or these other algorithms. Okay. Uh, Right. Uh, then, well, the thing uh, with so for elementary excitations using this this idea that the tangent space, uh, well, this this variational ansatz, that this somehow captures like quasi particle excitations on top of your ground state. Uh, in practice, this works extremely well. Um, so, for example, we computed for uh, like spin one Heisenberg chain the excitation spectrum. We get it very nicely and get like so 10, 12 digits precision on the Haldane gap, for example. Just using this the simple variational ansatz, um, <coughs> so this works extremely well in practice. So what we also did is, for example, look at some kind of spin on confinement system, um, where we indeed have some kind of uh, well, well, uh, basically we did some experiments where they um, looked at at the model that is effectively effectively described by this this Hamiltonian where you get like a lot of these like low energy modes here. And then we did the simulation using using this quasi particle and we, we saw this, these different modes very nicely as compared to the, to the, to the experiments. Um, and the thing is that we, we actually tried to do this also with the with deep time dependent DMRG uh, and you would, were not able to, to actually resolve these different, these different peaks in the, in the excitation spectrum. Uh, but with, uh, with this Ansatz, you can, can nicely capture all these sort of quasi particles. So these are diff the idea is that these are like different quasi particles in the system, and you can very nicely target all these separately using this, this ansatz. Um, well, uh, the cool the way we can actually, all, if we sort of include symmetries, physical symmetries in our in our MPS description, you can also assign like quantum numbers to these excitations, so we can target like spinons, charges, holons, like all these different fractional. Uh, these excitations with fractional quantum numbers very nicely. Uh, for example, in the one-dimensional Hubbard model, we can nicely see the, the spin-on dispersion relation to charge-on, and you can see the spin-charge separation on this. It works very well. 
Um, we also did like Luttinger liquids where we computed the excitation spectrum and we saw this very nice linear regime uh, in the spectrum so we can compute like Luttinger velocities using, uh, using this envelope. Um, we also did long range interactions uh, where you can see this, this sort of cross between the dispersion relation because of these long range interactions. Uh, so this was reproduced also by the sound dots. Well, we also extended this framework basically. So this is supposed to describe like a one particle excitation. Uh, so we extended this framework to like include like not only one, like one particle, but sort of two particles with like two beat tensors. And this allowed us to, to look in, into like two particle continua in, in these uh, systems. Um, where we could see like well, resonances in a two particle continuum and bound states and all these things. Uh, Try to simulate this. Um, right. So this is supposed to. This was supposed to sort of convince you that these standard-based methods um, can be used to indeed simulate like the dynamics on top of, of, of an MPS. But the, yeah. So I think our result was more hard to change. Yes. What the just the Heisenberg or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually. Uh, well, I, I showed like the results for the XXZ. I think this is well. This is just not the exact Heisenberg point, but like negative point. Uh, so, what is the exact? Yeah. So it's. I mean, we we, we did the the Hubble model as well. So this is some kind of. So this. I mean, this works pretty well. I think. Ah, uh, but I guess this is one one D Hubbard. So I think. Uh, and this is actually beat on that, I think, so they are just on top of each other. So this, this, is, this is indeed the first thing that we try to, to compare with beat on that. How about the shape of the spectrum, the you know, omega dependence? Yeah, yeah, so this is a full dispersion relation, right? So yeah, but if you, uh, we have omega that. dependence. I mean, do you see, ah. uh, you know, from the beta and so we have this sharp edge and the power wall divergence and things like that. Do you, do you see yeah, that? well, um, so we did uh, try this for gap systems, uh, and don't have so we did some, uh, if you have a gap, you can nicely, indeed, if, if you have like a continu two spin on continuum, for example, mm -hmm. you can capture this with, with this two particle ansatz, and then we really nicely see this edge of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the continuum. We didn't really try it for, um, but for, for gap systems, this is just a simple, like one half power law, I think. Um, but your question is probably this sort of, this, this, Generalized Luttinger liquid. This not a new liquid. I same question as this. I mean, if you compare really with the beta and such. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. for for the Luttinger liquids, we didn't really uh, investigate this 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 very. But, but also, I mean, also beta and such somehow has difficulties com like computing these these power laws. Right? So it's it's because uh, well, you, you have to you have to solve the like power exactly. But uh, numerically, if you solve the whole thing, I think you have to do it on finite systems. Yeah, exactly. But also you have to sum like a lot of like you have to do it's like sum two spin on four spin on yeah, six yeah. spin on. I think you, you get like ninety nine percent of the spin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. So for I mean, for the lecture like which we didn't really try it. Yeah, maybe my question is related to the previous question. Uh, do you have something to show uh, about uh, the tiny variation of the entanglement entropy? Uh, no, I I don't have it on the slides, but um, yeah, but indeed, I, I, sorry, yeah, okay. I suppose uh, if you uh, if you are dealing with the I mean, gap the system, then uh, the time by time evolution, you might expect uh, I mean, increasing. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. And in the end, uh, I mean, MPS description might be. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that's always the thing with uh, with MPS. Uh, for any methods for time evolution with MPS, is that at some point you the bottom dimension has to grow exponentially. And, and, uh, but, that, but that's one of the things that they did in this well, in this paper, right? Uh, they well, in the long time limit, they really saw like, well, you had, they have these plots um, yeah. where they plot uh, the entanglement entropy as a function of time. And then you really see, well, typically you have like this, this linear uh, growth in entanglement entropy. Um, and then they see indeed if they sort of work with the bond dimension, small dumb bond dimension, they see like uh, it desaturates at some point. Uh, if you take like a larger bond dimension, this sort of can take it a bit longer, but well, it's the same. You can take it a bit longer, but then it saturates again. Um, 
But in this paper, they, they show that, uh, well, well, in fact, you really, in order to simulate like terminalization and, and, and all these things, you actually don't really care about this. That it's sort of, as long as you conserve like the energy, then you get like the, that, that you actually get like the sort of terminalization process out of it possible. Um, uh, so does it mean uh, the, uh, the system does well, um, I don't know. Because in the end, <laughs> yeah. The thing is, well, the terminalization is always that indeed you have some kind of exponential growth of, of, of numerical resources that you need to actually capture like this entanglement entropy increase. But in the end, if you have a like terminalization process, the long time limit should also be sort of, mm -hmm. it should be able to represent efficiently using MPS or anything. So, mm -hmm. um, so the, yeah, so the, the real question is indeed how to indeed sort of connect these two limits in some sense. And, and, and as far as this, this paper is concerned, they say, well, you just sit the TV in you know, the equation, basically. I mean, this is very, well, still very controversial. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so far from clear. Yeah. Our question, so, uh, we are also playing uh, a spiritual function on the other hand. Yeah, yeah, I So, it's, it's, uh, just uh, discuss uh, some problem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so one of the main... your method, avoid this problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one, the nice thing about about this excitation spectrum, spectrum, um, I, sorry, with this quasi-particle on this, is, well, the thing is, if you do like time evolution, um, you basically, what, what they do in order to compute these spectral functions and need to quench like a, a local perturbation and then look at the time evolution and project. So what you do then is, is create a, like a lot of different particles, um, do like time evolution and do Fourier transform, and then look only look at the low energy part of this of this this thing. So what you're doing in your time evolution is actually way too much. You're also simulating the, like the, the, the high energy modes in, in your system, and then in the end you want to sort of project back on the, on the low energy part. So this this answer basically allows you to only target like the low energy part of your system, which you know has a, like a a, a nice uh, tensor network description. So this, in some sense, is, is like a natural way of, 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 of sort of only targeting the low energy space of your, uh, of your, of your quantum, in some sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, and then, like I said, I will. Um, Shortly, talk about uh, extensions to two dimensions of, the, of all this, of this whole framework. Um, so, the, I mean, sort of um, formally, the extension is very simple. You just uh, take a tensor instead of like a, a three like tensor, you take a five like tensor, and just make it like a uniform uh, PEPS state now, project and a pair state. Uh, and this is supposed to describe like two-dimensional uh, quantum spin systems. And again, uh, you, can have, you can have this picture of like the manifold of PEPs. Uh, you can even define like some kind of tangent space and all these things. So this, I mean, this is easily generalized in two dimensions. But then, all numerical computations that you want to do are a lot more expensive in, in two dimensions and are actually um, well, like the, the the computation that I did for the for the one-dimensional case were all exact in some sense. So if you want to do a computation in, in two dimensions, if, if you want to compute a norm, for example, you will have to introduce uh, approximations, and, and this makes life a lot more complicated um, to do the same thing for, for perhaps. But you, well, you want to try anyway, of course. Um, and one thing is that, well, if you want to do a variation of ground state uh, optimization, uh, you want to find the gradients of this uh, of, of your objective function. So like we had in the 1D case where we sort of wanted to differentiate with all um, with all tensors in, in, in the rally of your of your MPS. Now we have to sort of differentiate with all these tensors in the cat and in, in, in the rally of your PEPs. So basically, you want to differentiate with respect to this one with your like uh, new new here. Um, yeah. um, so this is indeed like an infinite sum over all these, where well, this good tensor can be basically anywhere, and you have to sum all these different contributions to get your gradients. Uh, so in the last years, uh, there were some approaches to actually compute this, this gradient uh, numerically using using um, well a lot of different uh, ways of contracting this 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 
this uh, diagram. So Philippe Cobo has developed this, this CTMRG uh, way of summing all these different uh, contributions. So we um, sort of came up with this channel environment way of, of, of well, I will not explain all, the, all of these things in any detail. So this is a way of, of summing up all these different contributions. And so um, well, these people uh, found a way to actually do this in some sort of automatic differentiation kind of way, computer gradient. And I guess, yeah, we'll talk about this tomorrow or this afternoon? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. So, I mean, you will get all details uh, tomorrow of how to do this with automatic differentiation. Uh, but in the end, I mean, these are all just approaches to a deep compute the gradient in an approximate way. Uh, and the cool thing is, if you actually use this gradient to do like um, uh, variation optimization of, of a prep state, you see that this, um, like, like in the case with the one dimensional uh, case, where, where, where variational optimization sort of brings you to the variational optimum, here again, uh, uh, perhaps optimization, like a variation optimization, brings you like to the to this these lines, whereas a sort of a TBD algorithm, like full rotate algorithm that people use, uh, brings you like to a state that is like slightly higher in, in energy. So again, you get like a better variation state using variation optimization. And this, and perhaps this is actually more a lot more drastic. So like I said, in one D, you know, don't really see the difference. This was to your question. Uh, in 2D, you actually do see a difference. For example, in the order parameter. You really see a big difference between, between the variation of the optimal state and like the, uh, the the one that you get with flow dates. Where this is indeed some sort of extrapolation with total to step size, uh, you see that you end up with like a slightly higher order parameter, for example, for the easy model. What are these two lines? Yeah, well, this is one dimension two and one dimension three. Uh, that's right. So, um, right. Okay, um, and then recently we also uh, um, extended the, the excitation to sort of the quasi-particle excitation answers that we did for 1D. Uh, we extended this to two-dimensional systems using PEPs. Um, again, the numerical manipulations are a lot harder, so we have to sum a lot, a lot of diagrams and all these things. So it's a real pain, but in the end, uh, we get like, good results, I think, with this, with this um, uh, method. So we confused it like dispersion relations of, of the easing model. Um, so we didn't find too many benchmark results, but there's like a, one benchmark of, of like series expansions, and we need to co confirm like the, the results um, accurately. So uh, as if we actually plot the gap of this dispersion relation, so the minimum as a function of the magnetic field, we indeed see the sort of the, the gap closing at, at the phase transition with like critical exponents that are pretty close to the Monte Carlo values. Um, so as a more sort of challenging benchmark, we also did the Heisenberg model in two dimensions, where we first, uh, first of all uh, looked at the sort of the spin wave excitation around the capless point, and we wanted to estimate the spin wave velocity. Uh, and you see indeed for like pretty low values of one dimension, you actually see the sort of the linear behavior um, of, the, of the spectrum really nicely. Uh, and we, we get like an estimate out of this for, for the spin wave velocity. You can see some kind of rounding off of the of the excitation spectrum close to close to the gapless point, and this is indeed some kind of reflection of the fact that a like tensor network like a PEPs or an MPS always induces some kind of finite correlation length in the system, so it induces some kind of finite gap. So you will always find some kind of finite um, gap opening up in your system if you simulate this thing uh, the system with a, with a finite bond dimension. But you will see that this gap sort of uh, grows smaller as if you increase the bottom axis. So we can nicely, still nicely see somehow the the, uh, the linear dispersion for for, for, for larger momentum. Right. Um, then we also looked at this spin wave anom um, anomaly around this this, this famous pi zero point, where they need saw in, in experiments that there's some kind of suppression of the of the spectral weight of the magnum. Um, and we computed this, this, basically this dip in the excitation spectrum um, if you approach this, this phi zero point, uh, and then well, we basically compare to to other methods where they compute this uh, this excitation energy around this point, and then this is, well, there's a big there's like a big spread in, in, in the values for this uh, for this excitation energy, and we're somehow in the middle between all of these. So I don't know what it is. Uh, 
shows that this is correct. I don't know, but uh, at least we kind of reproduce this 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 step in the next for example. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank. So, are there any questions? So uh, you have mentioned so uh, for regression methods, the complex number of um, like complex standards are better. Is this general? Mm. So, so you mean uh, you mentioned that uh, complex answers is better for yeah. regression methods, right? Yes. Uh, is this general or only for? Yeah, I think also for PEPs it's sort of helped, but I'm, I'm not sure actually. Uh, well, this is, I mean, I don't have any like strong proofs for that or something. It's just in practice, this seem to be. Uh, no, well, but I think other people have other experience with that. So, uh, so it, I mean, it also it's cheaper to use only the real values, of course. So, um, yeah, it depends on the case. On, on, on the case I guess. Okay. Yeah. I think in general, if you if you sort of try it with the real and then get stuck somewhere, it's actually, it might be a good idea to also go with, with complex values. So, 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 at the moment, there's no uh, like uh, generalization of real MPS. Yes. No, the, no, it's, we're kind of yeah. Well, if this, but the thing is, if you MPS uses um, canonical forms, right, and that's. So there's, I mean, there's some ideas around how to do this, but I mean, if someone would actually find like a good sort of canonical form for past this would change everything. I guess. But, yeah, yeah, you can also, I mean, um, so if you, like, if you have symmetry baking in some sense, um, well, you have, like, in, uh, like, two states, like, two IPSs, it's kind of, like, two, two tenses, and you can basically create some kind of particle excitation that is somehow interpolating between the two. So, and then, basically, go to A2. And then this would be some kind of a minimal, and you can easily just uh, sort of optimize with this B. And this would, you can actually, the nice thing is that if, you, since you're in the work, working in thermal dynamic limits, you can just target these sort of topological uh, domain wall sectors uh, just explicitly. Like in a, on a finite system, you would always um, either like break your quantum number, uh, break your momentum sort of transition then, so you will have momentum. Or if you're on a periodic system, you would have to sort of go to like two domain wall state to actually close this thing down. And, but in, in the turn limit, you can just look at one, one domain wall sector. 